simply an internalization of the law. The law that is written on the stone tablets <coughs> me, must be written in the hearts of the people. The renewal of the covenant is the renewal of the heart. The mechanism of this process is love. Why did God write the law on stones rather than the hearts of the people back then? I wondered that before. You know, we say now it's written on our hearts. Why didn't he do that in the first place? Probably did. That he did write it on their hearts? And that was, I mean, he just put it out more plainly for us because, you know, sometimes people say something, just say, like, keep it simple. You know, even nowadays, most laws are thought about and uh, put together and so forth, but before they actually are written down as laws. And I suppose that maybe back then it might have been the same thing that God had written it in, in their hearts and they knew about it, but then then it became written, sort of like our laws now. Uh, a law will be uh, formulated and put together, and then it gets, lots of people know about it, a lot of them don't, I guess, but then it gets written down and actually becomes, as they say, codified. Okay. I don't know. Anyone else? It was definitely on their hearts before because there when they were called out of Egypt, that, that's one thing that God, they were wanting to do is to continue their sacrifices and worship on Sabbath. So that was already in their hearts. It was, it was something they knew. As they had been in Egypt, they had kind of forgotten because they'd been there so long. But this was not new to them. Okay. And it was written on Abraham's heart. Abraham didn't have anything written down. Um, but I think like Dr. Hooper's point, I, I, okay, you write it on my heart, but my heart and my mind and needs help sometimes. That was like my, one of my parents, I know a couple weeks ago, I think she told me she was going to be gone last week. And I'm like, why didn't she tell me? Why didn't she tell me? It could have a couple of days that but, and I told her afterwards, you got, yes, you can tell me verbally, and that's great, but you need to write it down, send me a text, send me an email, something that I can see. Okay, she's gone, but I don't remember the exact days to write it out in stone, kind of. Yes, sir. If it was not written down, and if it was not in their hearts to begin with, up, and, up until it was written down, it would almost seem to indicate that it didn't exist. And we know good and well that, what, for 2,000 years or something? Yeah. They did, the people didn't live with non-existence of God's commandments. Well, that's where people will say, oh, the Sabbath was just for the Jews, you know, at Mount Sinai, he wrote it, and it was like, no, it was kept from the beginning of time. It was there. But because I guess people aren't happy, it wasn't written in stone somewhere back then, then, it, you know, it wasn't. And it didn't. And that's kind of hard. Yes, ma'am. Pass the baton to your wife. Well, I think that we need to be aware of something before we can embrace it. Uh, if there was no written law, why would they embrace it? So it had to be written down, number one. And the second, you know, uh, thing that comes in, God is, not, well, you know, this is what God wanted them to do because of their own good. But God doesn't want to force his law onto anybody. I think that writing something in our hearts, it's a mutual process, we have to open our hearts to that, to that law. We have to embrace that law. We have to open our hearts, and God is going to help us write that in, in, a heart, in our hearts. Uh, it, it's something mutual. Okay. It's a relationship. It's not, you know, God is not going to impose himself, in, himself and force himself onto anybody, but he has to 
I mean, God doesn't have to do anything, but you know, you know, the law needs to be. You know, people need to be aware of you know uh, where is this well wellness coming from. You know, if if you keep my commandments, it will it will be well with you. So you know, we know you know, and, and that is you know that the whole reason of you know God giving the commandments because He wanted the best for us. So He, you know, we have to be aware of the law. But then we have to embrace it. We have to um, uh, incorporate it into our heart, and that is something that it, it's a mutual. We need to we need to desire that, and God is going to help us um, put that in our hearts and to desire that. Okay. Well, I'm going to go back just a little to the written, and you said it needs to be written so you can see. I mean, we all take it for granted that we live in a world where there is written stuff over there to river. Um, but there was a time there wasn't a written language and that wasn't originally how he intended it. That it had to be written down. He said, teach it to your children and pass it down. And if we were doing what we were supposed to, we'd be passing it down to each child. And there's something special. I mean, how many of you can look back at your grandparents and remember something your grandmother or your grandfather taught you? It wasn't written down. You have it in your heart. It's almost how you live your life. Because um, we usually say grandparents are really important. Just I was fortunate enough to know even great grandparents. They didn't write any of this stuff that I learned from them, but it's in my heart. And I think God knew when you found, you heard it from a, and back then they had great grandparents and great, great grandparents and great, they got to learn from, that would have been wild. But um, that when you were told it by someone who loves you so much, and you love so much, kind of like the relationship Adam and Eve would have had with Jesus, that you don't need it written down and you remember it better because it's in what my grandma has taught me and what I, my grandfather taught me is in my heart. And I don't need it reminded because I, I see it. I see it in my kids. I see it, you know, just in, in life when I, in traditions and things. All right, I'll stop, River, and you can talk. Well, I have a question. When we go into this judge righteously, you know, I'm really, I feel a little bit kind of not confused, but I just feel a little bit baffled. Okay, so we've heard over and over that our Father will never leave us nor forsake us. Well, then I got to thinking about some things that the Bible was teaching me about, you know, if you stay strong in the Word and then you. And then this thing about judge righteously. And then I was like, well, then how are these people who read the word, how is it that their minds get deceived? And then we were talking about in the last days about when, you know, the Antichrist is going to be able to perform like Jesus. And then I'm thinking to myself, if the Lord loves us that much, how are we going to be deceived? And it just kind of scares me because then I started reading about this judge righteously. And I was like, I want to stay on course and do everything that God tells me to do. I don't want to be one of those people that get deceived and go the wrong way. But then I, it terrifies me because I was really searching about, you know, how the devil can manipulate and mess with people. And I'm thinking, but that scripture keeps telling me, you know, who is for us, who's not against us. You know, he'll never leave us nor forsake us. And then it just kind of went, am I missing something? So I just wanted to know how this judge righteously comes into effect when we're really trying to do what's right and we think we're talking to God and it's not God. Anybody want to take that on? Um, One thing we have to remember. One thing I think we really need to focus on, and that is the fact that we do not want to focus on the devil's power. So we do need to focus on God and the solution, and He has that. And then He can speak to us. But when we focus on the devil, and he has lots of power, no doubt, much more than we can overcome, then his 
then he becomes more powerful in, to us. So we really have to work on focusing on God's power, and then that becomes our life, and he is able to speak to us more. I, I think, think you're right. Thank you. Um, I think if we have a conviction and a relationship and the fact that you're worried about that, you know, I've heard someone say, you know, I'm worried about being a good mom. And they're like, if you're worried about it, that kind of tells you you're a good mom. Um, that you're concerned and God knows in your heart. You said, I've been searching. I think you're just, you're there. You're just two months ahead because I got, I've looked at what next quarter is. And it's these last days, the message of Hebrews where we get to know what in the last days. I mean, I think it's not, you're not alone. We all think about it. They say, except for the very deceived. And when you focus on those bad things, it was, I can't remember what it was on Facebook. It was David didn't go into battle worrying about how straight, strong Goliath was or how strong Satan was. He went into battle knowing how strong his God was. And when you have that mind, you have a child who knows, I know my daddy's the biggest, strongest in the world. Really doesn't matter how big that other person is. That person be twice as big as their daddy. But they know their dad can handle anything because they have a relationship and he's never let them down. And um, I think if you're focusing on God and not Satan, because he wants you to focus on him, we have those out kind of as warnings you know, when you see the sign, you know, curve ahead, you're not speeding up to 100 to see if you can. But just to say, pay more attention. Um, and I think that was Thursday's lesson. We're going to try to get there. You're jumping ahead. You say, right. you're being Gordon since he's not here, aren't you? Yes, you are. Um, and then real quick, I was going to say, okay, so we have the law on our heart. But then I said, why did they have to renew and Dr. Cooper said, because yeah, they went downhill. But do we? Do we need to renew our co the covenant? Why? How often is it an important thing if it's to renew the covenant that we have with God? Yes, ma'am. Also, also. Our speaker, our, our guys back there, our uh, thing's not working. You're, you're okay. making them not pay Okay. Also, the people said, all that you have said, we will do it. And we can't do it. It's when we rely on God. So that's why he needed to put it on our hearts and let him come into us. And he lives it out in our lives, not us doing it. When we try to do it, we fail. I think sometimes it's really easy for us to look at the children of Israel and look at them as like real big screw-ups. But it's a whole lot easier to see everybody else's big old screw up than uh, laying in bed at 11 o'clock at night. They start to come to you that you really aren't that much different than the children of Israel. Yes, sir. To your question, <clears throat> excuse me, to your question, if a covenant has not been broken, does it need to be renewed? Uh, grab the I mean, people sometimes renew their marriage vows. That's not super unusual, especially nowadays. And um, I don't know, like it, that, that doesn't always, you know, it's not always that they were divorced or, you know, anything. They just and that happened. Just yeah, sometimes they just have a renewal of the vows. If I ever get to Niagara Falls, I've already told Rob we're getting married there again. I have a few spots. It's just fulfillment. But no, but you say okay. Um, but you're married to that person. You may not renew the vows, but love is patient and kind and all of those things. And you can say, if I've been, you know, I'm married and everything's great, I don't have to. But no, I think you still need to look at what marriage is, what love is, because we kind of need to think, oh, I'm doing all of them. And then you got five there and you're actually only doing three of them. You forgot these two. You know, you go to the grocery store, you better have a list because... You're going to forget. So I don't know. Renew the covenant because you broke it. Or maybe review the covenant so you don't forget anything. It's just a affirmation, I think. You do have to sit closer together. No, go ahead. 
when she was talking about the 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 marriage relationship, I, I think that's an affirmation, which is a little bit different than renewal. When we talk about renewal regarding anything, it's I don't know, it's renewal is doing it over again. <laughs> I renew subscriptions to things. I don't know. If I renew something, doesn't every spring earth kind of renew itself all over again? And that's just any relationship. Because you made. Not, well, we're human and everything's made brand new. And I think in relationships, whether with a person or with God, if you're not renewing, if you're not making it fresh, if you're not doing stuff, then it starts to, to get old, get gray. And there's nothing new, different wrong with renewing, um, reminding of what you had. I know you're a stickler for words and their definitions. Yeah, we're probably getting too picky here. <laughs> I know I'm going, I'm coloring out of the lines is what the problem is. Okay, well, then we're going to move on. And we're going to open our Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 10, because that's what our thing was on. And chapter 10, verses 12. Um, did somebody want to read 10, 12? Oh, no, that's weird. All right, Deuteronomy 10, verse 12. It says, Now, O Israel... What does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you today for your own good. Okay, so what does God expect of us? What? Obey him. Okay. And fear him. To fear him, to love him. If you said something else, I didn't hear you. You need to yell louder. To fear him, to love him, to walk in his ways, which I guess you could say obey, and to do so willingly. Not, I know we've been doing training at school, and they said even if you grab a kid and you have a fight and you make them do it, what has actually been learned, it kind of defeats the whole reason why you were, th why you were there but to do it willingly. Then on to 13. I never noticed this. I think I always read it like there was a period at the end, but the English Standard Version, the King James Version, and the New International Version all end this verse with a question mark. Why would God make this a question? And that would have been 13, which was, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. I can't even read it as a question. I know, it's too long of a Well, no, it's just, I don't know. It, 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 but it's a question. Why is it a question? Because the first one starts with what? Yeah. What, ask, what does the Lord your God ask of you? Ask okay. Well, yeah. English actually. <laughs> so, but, so, okay. What does the Lord to serve you with? Okay, with your heart and your soul. Okay, and the statutes which I command for you. But no, 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 no. Because if he said, what does the Lord God require of you? It should be question mark. Yeah, it didn't, it didn't. But it's not. Is that because somebody made a mistake who was transferring it? Or was that purposely supposed to be a question mark? Did you say something? Nope. Nope. Okay. Um, I did. I jump around, and there was a person who said, God is asking us to think about this. That's why it's question mark. In past lessons, we discussed that the purpose of the Ten Commandments is to make our lives better and to bring glory to God. And God wants us to contemplate that. That was interesting. But like I said, I've always read that as a period, not a question mark. I can't even read it. You don't. 
Um, at the beginning, it's like, what, what are you, what do you want God more to ask of you? Those are the simple things. I think we complicate with man-made rules of all the things that God wants from us. And, and we make all of these, these things in life and they're saying, what, what else on this list? These are the things, what else are you wanting? Because this is it. We are here to, you know, to walk in his way, to observe his commandments, to love him with everything. What, what more are you wanting to add to this list? All right, so then Deuteronomy 14 through 16. Would someone like to read that? Verses 14 through 16. Mm -hmm. To the Lord your God belong the heavens, even the highest heavens and the earth and everything in it. Yet the Lord set his affection on your forefathers and loved them, and he chose you, their descendants, above all the nations as it is today. Circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked any longer. Okay, what does it mean to circumcise your heart? What did you say? You didn't say. That is a funny word. But it's not the only time it is used in the Bible. Moses' reference to the uncircumcision of the lips in Exodus suggests that his lips were closed and that he cannot speak fluently. Jeremiah deplores that Israel is uncircumcised ears, meaning that they cannot hear the word of the Lord. The circumcision of the heart is an image that symbolizes the inner circumcision that Paul will describe later as the conversion of the Christian, a deepening of the same covenant and its laws. This entails not just refraining from doing wrong, but more important, not desiring to do wrong, kind of with the, the end of that other one, your free will, not just refraining from doing wrong, but engaging one's whole life in doing good. Only love will make this commitment possible. Um, 16 was a real word picture. It said, therefore, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. What do you think, and I'm going to assume everyone knows stiff Nick, we can agree, is being stubborn. What do you think God wants from us when he asks us to refrain from being stiff-necked or stubborn? What do you think God wants from us when he asks us to stop being stiff-necked and stubborn? Are we stiff-necked, stubborn people? How are we stiff-necked, stubborn people? To try it every way. <laughs> Miss, Mrs. Swanson says, I'll do it my way. Edda said, there's five ways. And five wrong ways to do a thing, and you ought to try it every single time. <laughs> <laughs> not talking about me. Anybody else? Why would he put that being stubborn and a circumcised um, heart together? Hold on. Can I say that again, River? So we think that we know all the answers, but we don't know all the answers. And so we need every one of us to help build each other up, to edify us, and to keep us in our place. Anyone else? And Mrs. Swanson just said from being prideful. That's what she said before. Oh, that's what she said earlier was from being prideful. Anyone else? Um, I have a few questions. What do you think God wants from us when he asks us? Oh, no, there it is. How does the image of the circumcision of the heart relate to the image of the stiff neck? No, give her the mic. Oh, sorry. No, no, I said don't, not River. So Mrs. Swanson was being honorary. <laughs> Go ahead. Because when you're circumcising your heart, you're you're actually plunging your heart. You're getting rid of all the, the intentions and the sin and the ugliness that you have. And so when you're doing that, comparing that with the stiff neck, you're dying to your flesh. You're, you're getting rid of that. So when you let it go, when you circumcise it, it's just like when you cut yourself, you're releasing all that bad blood, and then you're refreshing with new blood. I like the idea that when you're circumcising, you're cutting away. 
And if we're, it says, okay, then to, so we can get in the Paul's message, we have to cut that away so we can have the deeper relationship so he can even write those words on our heart because that part that needs to be cut away, um, she's killing me here. <laughs> that part that needs to be cut away, God can't get in. It's kind of like covering up the hole where God wants to come in and write. Dr. Cooper. It would seem like this would be very close to baptism in that baptism is indicating a big change in life that is an outward indication to everybody else. And circumcision of the heart is a inward, similar kind of experience of change that's taking place within, within you, but not necessarily visible to other people. I mean, it, it may be visible, but not necessarily so. I was gonna say, should it be visible? Should it be, I've got a lot of heads shaking, yes, that if you if you've said I've uncircumcised it and God's in there and it's not visible, either you were pretty awesome beforehand or somewhere there's not the trans, that, that stuff's not there anymore. They shouldn't see that bad stuff anymore. That's kind of the, the fruits of it, though. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, the it's the evidence of it. It's not the actual happening that takes place within you but it's followed up with the evidence for sure okay um what makes this commitment possible what makes it possible for us to have this circumcision apart to quit being stiff-necked stubborn i mean i've heard people say stubborn you tell me i'm stubborn i'm actually not going to take it as you know i'm going to take it as a compliment but um, what makes this commitment possible? God's grace. God's grace. Somebody, I can't remember who said that I can do it all myself type of thing. And um, realizing we can't, the Holy Spirit has to make all that possible. Um, because like I might know my father's passing away and I can say only so much. Jackie can only say so much. My mom can only say so much. But I've come to the conclusion what we really have to do is pray for the Holy Spirit to go in there, be relentless. And um, I know I've, I've told my, I told my dad this last time when we get to heaven and my great grandma Hotchkiss was, um, a very special woman. And I know from the day my dad was born until the day she died, she prayed every day for his soul to be saved. And sometimes I think when she gets to heaven and she asks God, where is he? He's, going, he's either going to be there or if he's not, God's going to say, I gave this man so many, and trust me, the stories, so many chances that he'll say it was his choice. But it's, it is his choice. It is our choice, but only through the Holy Spirit. I mean, we're messengers and we can do a lot and God expects us to. But God expects us, I think a lot of times we think we're doing it, we're not. We're introducing the person to the Holy Spirit that's going to make that possible. What are the risks of an emphasis on love at the expense of the stiffness or strictness of justice? Because our lesson talked a lot about that, of God's love and having a love relationship with God and love covers everything, but then there's justice. And it talked about that when we're, and I think we're kind of heading into the stranger and um, at a... I think one of the risks is that, um, you know, we forget the, the third angel's message in the last day is to fear God because the hour of his judgment has come. Um, you know, and, and we can't forget that, you know, God's judgment is actually an act of love and justice. But, um, if we focus too much on, uh, you know, it's a balance. If we're just, you know, think that God is just all about love and that he's going to turn a blind eye to sin, then we're just we're kind of missing the whole picture. I think the whole world thinks that if you love somebody, 
you know, love covers all and love is blind, but there is a part where love is justice. Um, Monday's le lesson went into love the stranger. Loving your neighbor is one thing, but the stranger too. Why did God require Israel to love the stranger? And I have five, five different reasons. What are some reasons why God said to love the stranger? Okay, they were, is that, did she take yours? Oh, you took hers. All right, because I said there's five. So because they were strangers in Egypt, whatever. All right, that's okay. Because God, okay, so we have, first of all, because Israel used to be strangers, Deuteronomy says this reason is based on the principle you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Because, and then like um, Susan said, because God loves the stranger. This reason is rooted in the faith in the creator who owns heaven and earth. Two principles are implied in this reason. First, there is a principle that God has created the stranger in his image. The second principle derives from the first one. It is the principle of imitation of God um, by his servants. Okay, um, I still have three more. Anyone else? Why are we supposed to love the stranger? Need it. They need it. And, and that's a good one. You provide what people need. If you're providing food and clothing, but the stranger needs love. I like that. Um, another one I had was to prepare to meet God. God belongs to another order. He is the Holy one who is essentially different from us humans. The best pedigree in how to love God could be to learn to love the one who is different than you a stranger. Um, another one, to prepare to meet with other people. As former slaves, Israel had to learn to see others not just as cruel masters they hated, but as neighbors to commune with and to share with in love. The experience of love gets richer and stronger when it's lived between two people. And that had me on a question, does our past or our, our experiences right now reflect on how we deal with strangers? And is that okay? If you've had a bad experience with, uh, with strangers, we tell our kids, stranger danger, don't talk to strangers. That that's really not something that's in our culture. Um, but then on the other hand, we live in America and you go anywhere, you usually can find somebody who's willing to help you. There was the story of the farmer who had COVID and all the other farmers stopped what they were doing and harvested his land so he didn't have to worry about it. You know, you have a broken tire, your flat tire on the road and somebody pulls over. Um, but the Israel had bad experiences with strangers that he had to rebuild their past. God knows we have a past. We come in, everyone comes in with a past. And he asks us to do these things that are like, it's like when the doctor says you need to eat healthy or you need to exercise, you go, can't you just give me a pill? And God says, no, that's not how I'm going to fix you. That's not how I'm going to heat and that's maybe a fix, but heal you. And teaching them how to tell, you have to learn how to love the strangers heals you from what the strangers did to you in the past. Real quick, I just a comment on um, loving them because they were strangers in Egypt. I think, you know, God was outlining a lot of principles for how they were to treat people. You know, I, I don't know. I don't have a lot to say about how they were treated in Egypt, but, you know, they were slaves in Egypt. So I imagine that a lot of their treatment probably was not just or fair. Um, and so God was outlining these principles of how they were to run their government because and they were to never forget how they were treated in Egypt and that they were slaves in Egypt. Okay. Thanks. How do you deal with panhandlers? I don't know. I did have a lesson that was part of the one I cut out in mind that dealt with panhandlers, did with people crossing the border. I chose to be not political <laughs> in case my mom showed up, I'd be in trouble. Um, that's a good question. That's a good question. A lot of times I let the Holy Spirit speak to my heart. And if he tells me to do it, I've actually ignored it before. And he still doesn't let go. So I have to go all the way around the block and 
come back and do what I was told the first time. Uh, was that the second bell? Yeah. No, it. Yeah. We didn't hear that. You guys are too based on the law. He's more love. Okay, to pray. I'm going to do this one in my closing. To prepare to shape and fulfill their own destiny as strangers, as former nomads in the wilderness, the Israelites had to learn the way of holiness and the value of living with different people without compromising their own holy identity. In the same way, Abraham, Joseph, and Daniel had to learn how to live with the tension of reconciling the duty of holiness with the duty of love. And when I first saw that, to prepare and shape their own destiny, I thought of that song, um, this isn't my, my home, I'm only passing through. Technically, we're strangers. And then treat each other as they'd like to be treated. Take that down. Okay, I'm doing the close. Miss really good stuff. I'm doing the close. Ellen G. White in Selected Messages, book one, three, pages 320 and 321, says... The commandments of God are comprehensive and far-reaching. In a few words, they unfold the whole duty of man. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. In these words, the length and breadth and depth and height of the law of God is comprehended, for Paul declares love is the fulfilling of the law. The only definition we find in the Bible for sin is that sin is the transgression of the law. The word of God declares there is none that does good. No, not one. Many have deceived concerning the condition of their hearts. They don't realize that the natural heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. They wrap themselves about with their own righteousness and are satisfied in reaching their own human standards of character. But how fatally they fail when they do not reach the divine standard and of themselves they cannot meet the requirements of God. We may measure ourselves by ourselves. We may compare ourselves among ourselves. We may say we do as well as the one or that, this one or that one. But the question to which the judgment will call for an answer is, do we meet the claims of high heaven? Do we reach the divine standard? Are our hearts in harmony with the God of heaven? Um, let us bow our heads. Dear Lord, thank you for this Sabbath day. Thank you for all our brothers and sisters here that are here to lift us up, to remind us of why we're here. Lord, please open our hearts. Help us to love our, love our neighbors, love the strangers, love our families, and to grow closer and more like you every day. Please bless us this Sabbath and the ones who aren't here. In your name we pray. Amen.